Smith landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico. And the rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. W. Brazil was the man who discovered the topper. What I thought was a star began coming in my direction at a very rapid uh, rate of speed. The unidentified object, which some sources thought might be a blimp, moved slowly down the Pacific coast from Santa Monica and disappeared south of Long Beach. I saw a UFO and it went down the river, turned right at the United Nations, turned left and then down the river. UFO Classified. UFO Classified. No more plausible deniability. Fact. Fiction. Or the truth. You decide. And now, the new voice of the high desert, the hostess of UFO Classified. Erica Lukes. Well, good afternoon, good evening, my friends. I hope you are having a wonderful holiday season. I know I am, and I'm looking forward to my trip to Germany in the next few weeks. That will be fun. I will have meetings there with specific people who are involved in in German ufology, which should be interesting, and I will keep you posted on that. Of course, you know, it's always a busy, busy uh, week for me because I'm not only managing a business, I am also doing spending hours and hours every day researching and trying to preserve history, write my book with Gordon Lore. I've got a lot going on, but as you know, to me, this is the most important subject that we could ever deal with, and I believe that it should be dealt with with integrity, and we deserve the truth, which we are simply not getting. I want to thank all of the people for being in chat. You are my biggest supporters, and Douglas, I hope you're feeling better. I want to thank Doug Wright for everything. Of course, Northern UFOs, it's good to see Dave and Echo and and Hal Putoff. I love that. That's always a good one. Uh, And Victoria, but you guys mean the world to me. I'm here because of, of this family that we have all created together. We are asking the right questions where we're making sure that we're not following every uh, bright, new, shiny star that comes along, because hopefully all of us know that history should be teaching us some lessons. And the bottom line is the history of the subject tells us very clearly and concisely that the United States government really has no true interest in disclosing this subject or the truth about what they know. It will be used as some sort of manipulation, some ploy, like it has been for the past 60 plus years. So we need to to get over that. I've had some interesting feedback on my YouTube channel, although it's it's 99% really positive and I appreciate all of you, but occasionally I'll get, you know, people that are the the TTSA supporters that are living and dying uh, by them. I'm not sure if they're paid uh, to, to do that, to get in there and kind of troll and cause trouble. Uh, I have a feeling that some of them are, but I also think, um, unfortunately, younger people that get involved in this subject or people that don't understand the history or the complexities of it fall down these these rabbit holes and they, they drink the Kool-Aid. And although I would love to believe that everything is on the up and up, I think we need to ask some serious questions and we need to to step back and look at the people involved, look at the history, like I said, and be very guarded and thoughtful when it comes to putting our eggs in a certain basket. So that's all I'm going to say on that one. Thank you. I will get off my little pulpit right now and make way for my guest this evening. My guest has a show on KCOR on Thursday evenings. He's been on my show once before. I've been on his show with uh, Tim Schwartz. And uh, I have to say that Tim Green, Timothy Green Beckley is probably one of the most colorful people in, in the history of ufology. He has done a lot of different things, authored many different books. He has, he worked for, with the Inquirer. And I will say that back in the day, the Inquirer actually did uh, publish some very interesting, some very great articles on UFOs. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, his longest running effort of, of the newsstand publication was UFO Universe, which went on for 11 years. He is president of the Interlight Global Communications editor of the Conspiracy Journal and Bizarre Bizarre, 
and has been in this subject since he was, he's been passionate about it since he was a child. He's had out-of-body experiences, paranormal experiences, UFO sightings. Uh, Nancy Burns, editor of the UFO magazine, described him as the Hunter Thompson of ufology. He has written many books, including with topics like MJ-12 and uh, underground bases, all sorts of Nazis and UFOs, all sorts of great things. I will be posting links to his work, but I have to say that it's been a pleasure getting to know him. And Tim, thank you for, for coming on the show. You, I have to say, you uh, your life, what haven't you done? Uh, robbed a bank. That's comforting. <laughs> <laughs> the night's still young. That's I don't the, know. Like, the only thing I could think of at the, uh, at the it's such a quick, quick, uh, <laughs> quick, uh, quick notice. No, I, I guess uh, I, I always I have a one statement that uh, I've had so many occupations that even my girlfriend doesn't know what I do for a living. But I don't have a girlfriend, so that turns out to be a total lie at the uh, <laughs> at the. Uh, at the, at the moment. No, I, I guess I've done a lot of things. You know, I started in this, uh, I had a UFO sighting when I was uh, 10 years old. Uh, I sound like a tape recorder saying this because I've told it so many times. It was a warm summer night in uh, July or August, would have been around 1957. And in those days, uh, we nobody had any air conditioner, or a few people did. So we would set out on the front uh, stoop uh, into a, until it you know cooled off, and then you could go inside. And I guess we were there with a couple of uh, neighbors, and my mother was sitting on the stairs, and somebody came uh, running up to where we were and uh, said, "Take a look at these objects in the sky." Now uh, there were two objects; they were brightly lit. Uh, I would say craft, but I didn't see like any portholes or landing gear or the hull of the. Uh, of the uh, of a ship, uh, but they were two uh, two brightly lit uh, uh, lights. I would say about maybe 30, 40 feet in diameter. They were up above the cloud layer. Uh, one was uh, over a um, an abandoned uh, factory building across the street, and the other one was almost directly above the uh, the house uh, where we were seated on the front porch. This was in uh, New Brunswick, uh, New Jersey, where I was born and raised. And the uh, objects, they kept cir- they kept circling overhead. The one that was across the street over the factory building would come and just change positions with the one uh, that was over the house and vice versa. And this went on, I guess, for about, um, oh, maybe 15 minutes uh, or so. Now, of course, there was no sound associated uh, with it. They, it was dead silent. Uh, there were not, I, I would say, maybe a half a dozen uh, witnesses. Uh, to this. And then finally, we just kind of, I guess, lost interest in it. They weren't doing anything uh, monumental. The one across the street, it just blinked out like somebody had pulled the light switch. And the other one continued the circle uh, up ahead, but we went into the, you know, went into the house by that time. Now, the next day, there was a little item in the newspaper a couple of days later uh, to the effect that the authorities had said that there were other sightings but it was nothing more uh, than a weather balloon. Well, I knew even at the age of 10 that this was something that seemed to be under intelligent control. And, you know, after all these years, the planet Venus always gets accused of being a a UFO and weather balloons. Well, you know, I don't know if I've ever seen a weather balloon. I mean, I've seen party balloons, you know, people setting up in the air to celebrate a a sweet 16 uh, birthday or something. But unless you're near a weather station or something, what's your chances of seeing a weather balloon? I, I would say pretty darn uh, uh, nil. I don't know. And, well, and, and the fact they're, they're supposed to be, I mean, they should be flying at a, an altitude that you they shouldn't be visible to the human eye. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's correct. I, I mean, uh, any any idiot can probably tell a a, a weather uh, weather balloon. But so it wasn't a weather balloon. <laughs> uh, okay, so I've started... Um, Writing in those days, uh, every town had a newspaper. How about that? You can't. You, here I am in New York City, and you got to walk ten blocks to find a, an actual physical newspaper these days. Believe it or not. Uh, okay, so every town had a newspaper. So I started writing letters to the editor, uh, and uh, you know, to talking about UFOs and asking if other people had had uh, sightings and so forth and so on. And they printed the letters, and I started getting some uh, feedback. 
And around 14 years old, I went out. I had saved uh, some money. In those days, you could put, if you were going to like a grade school, you could put 50 cents in the bank a week. They were, they were teaching children how to save money. Erica, could you imagine that? Can you imagine going to a bank today and trying to put in 50 cents? But, uh, no, anyway, but... You, uh, there you go. Anyway, you had, okay, so I had saved up maybe about $350, $400. I went out and I started my career. I bought a Gestetner mimeograph machine. And I published the Interplanetary News Service Report. Jerry Clark, who, of course, uh, years later was one of the editors of Fate magazine and uh, worked on over at the Center for UFO Studies, typed my stencils. I don't know if he likes <laughs> to admit that. I don't know if he likes to admit that or not, but we were one big gang of teenagers. In those days, uh, there was uh, teenage UFO uh, uh, groups, uh, and there are people like Gene Steinberg, who still has the po uh, Paracast, and uh, some of the other, Rick Hilberg out of uh, Cleveland, uh, uh, Alan Greenfield down in uh, Atlanta. They're still around. We started out when we were, you know, 16 and 17, and now we're 70. <laughs> but uh, we, you know, we, we, we stuck uh, with it. So I, I went out and I bought this mimeograph machine and started putting out a, a little newsletter. It was 10 pages long and had a, a subscription to begin with of 75 people. Well, by the time I gave the subscriptions over to Jim Mosley, I had a, a readership of about 1,500 which was about as many members as APRO uh, uh, had, actually. Uh, and we had a, a board of directors made up of other UFO researchers, and uh, people from all over the world were contributing to the, uh, the, uh, the um, information. It, it was a rather uh, a crudely done uh, publication. I mean, it was typed on a typewriter, and the, if you ever saw a mimeograph publication, it, uh, you know, the ink has kind of uh, got thumbprints on it. In fact, my my mother threw me out onto the uh, back porch because the kitchen looked like a crime scene, except that the uh, finger, in instead of the fingerprints being red, you know, like in blood, there were black fingerprints from the ink all over the refrigerator and the kitchen cabinets and, and, and all of that. It, it, it was a job because there was no Kinko's or, or uh, you know, any of these places. You got to, you, you had to take out the ironing board and put the stacks of paper. Uh, we ended up, uh, the newsletter was like 40 pages long, so that's 20 sheets of paper. You got to collate it and staple it. Mm -hmm. And and what a job that was, but it, 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 it was a worthwhile uh, effort. Uh, I mean, there are some articles in there. I, I look back uh, and uh, once in a while I'll grab an old article and, and reprint it because people from 50 years ago, unfortunately, or some of them, or most of them are not around uh, anymore. And and that be, that began my uh, uh, publishing uh, career. And then uh, I went to work for Jim Mosley. He was known as the, uh, I guess, the trickster of uh, ufology. He and the uh, Gray Barker, who had the Caesarian Press, always were doing a little uh, pranks and and stuff. They uh, had uh, created a a hoax letter, the straight letter, that was signed by uh, on an official government stationery. Uh, and they sent it to George Adamski, making him believe that the State Department was supporting his contact claims. Well, you know, childish uh, stuff, but people considered him like, a, you know, a big uh, prankster, he and Gray uh, uh, Barker. So I, I went to work for Jim, and I, I started coming into New York, commuting every day. And I ended up uh, being a, a stringer, like you say, for the Inquirer. And over the years, I've edited uh, something like 30 different newsstand magazines, most of which never uh, uh, lasted for more than uh, a couple of issues. I was the editor of magazines like uh, Front Page Disasters, which I actually enjoyed doing because we always threw in something that was a little strange, like, you know, planes disappearing in the uh, Bermuda Triangle or a, um, uh, a battalion of uh, army uh, uh, soldiers disappearing into a, a bank of clouds and never being seen again. We always managed to sneak in something that was just a little bit, uh, un, you know, uh, unusual. And, and then I, I put out the UFO, uh, uni, a UFO review, which was the world's only flying saucer newspaper that had a circulation of about 35,000. That was, you know, there's no magazine today that even has that kind of, there's no magazines anymore. But uh, uh, even in those days, that was one of the leading, uh, uh, pub, you know, publications. So, uh, and then I had the Occult Center, the New York School of Occult Arts and Sciences, which was one of the first metaphysical uh, centers in the country. We had speakers, and Woody Derenberger, and uh, gosh knows, all the uh, Dan Fry, and 
all the contactees that were pretty big in those uh, days that would uh, make the uh, the rounds. And uh, then I also promoted rock and roll shows, some limited things like the New York Dolls, and the Harlots of 42nd Street and the Magic Tramps, and Satan the Fire Eater, which is where Kiss got their act from. Okay, so I, that's, that's my career in a... Uh, that's what I did 40 years ago. Now you want to know what I do today? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, you know, I do. And I think there's some interesting things in between yeah. there that we should talk about yeah, too. But yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think, you know, a lot of the younger people that are getting into this don't mm-hmm. understand, you know, Jim Mosley and Gray Barker and who some of these, these people were that made a big impact yeah. and, and things. Oh, yes. so you could explain a little bit about them. That would be awesome. Well, okay. Well, the, uh, the originator, I, I thank the uh, the uh, gentleman who is accused, and we can use that in, in quotes, uh, of having invented the, the flying saucer mystery was Ray Palmer, uh, who I uh, did a column for. Uh, but uh, he was the original uh, publisher of uh, Fate magazine, and along with uh, Curtis uh, Fuller. But l- let me go back uh, a little bit to the, <laughs> I, I guess, to the mid-1940s, a little bit before I was uh, born. But... Uh, uh, around the uh, the time that I uh, I came about, uh, uh, science fiction was big in in those days, and Ray Palmer uh, uh, was the editor of a magazine called Amazing Stories. Uh, Amazing Stories was a cheaply published little pulp magazine that sold for a quarter, and it had a uh, futuristic uh, stories. It was all supposed to be a, a science a fiction. There was nothing, uh, you know, remotely paranormal uh, uh, about it. Although later on, like I say, he did start Fate magazine. Uh, one day, uh, while he, uh, Mr. Palmer was out of the uh, office, uh, the uh, assistant editor uh, opened up, uh, was opening up the mail, and there was a manuscript uh, in there uh, written by a fellow by the name of Richard Shaver. Now, Richard Shaver claimed that there was an ancient civilization that had visited Earth and had constructed uh, large cities underneath the uh, er, you know, Earth in, in caverns, and that uh, this civilization uh, was made up, well, of people, I guess, that had once lived on the surface, but they moved underground because of the radioactivity from the, uh, the sun. And over the centuries, they had become very demented. And he claimed that he was hearing voices and that there were death rays and, and all this weird stuff going on. And for, uh, he talked about Atlantis and lost continents and, and, and spaceships. And Ray Palmer, for some obscure reason, decided to publish the manuscript. Now, Shaver, who I uh, had uh, my own correspondence with years later, was not a very good writer. And in those days, if you worked for the uh, the pulp magazines, you got paid anywhere from a half a cent to uh, two pennies a word, which actually is more than you get paid today, come to think of it. Uh, but uh, he published a series of these articles, and uh, people started writing in, uh, telling of their similar ex- experiences of seeing strange things in the sky. Now, this, again, was before Kenneth Arnold's uh, sighting, but... They reported seeing strange uh, things in the sky, hearing weird voices, communicating with uh, different entities and so forth. However, it got to the point where uh, the science fiction people who had originally supported the uh, magazine and who the publication was supposedly being uh, put out for uh, got on a letter writing campaign to the publisher Ziff Davis complaining that the magazine was being taken over by a bunch of lunatics. And they didn't like this. Now, Erica, if you know anything about the science fiction field, science fiction people totally have a disdain for UFOs. I mean, there is just no camaraderie uh, there uh, whatsoever. And uh, the reason being is that the science fiction crowd, uh, which is, in my opinion, are a bunch of uh, non-thinkers, have been told by their uh, leaders like Isaac Eisenhoff and Arthur C. Uh, Clark, uh, that there is nothing to the subject uh, at all, that it's all uh, fraudulent and made up, and uh, there are no uh, aliens coming here from other planets. And if these people made a statement, it was taken as a gospel. So the science fiction people just totally disliked and had a total distaste for the UFO people. 
And UFO people as a rule, although there might be some uh, uh, people who like Star Trek, and I know I've seen Close Encounters, uh, you know, six or seven times. Mm -hmm. For the most part, there is no uh, interlocking relationship uh, between the two uh, uh, fields. So Palmer felt that he had to go out and, and, and start a magazine on his, on his own. So he uh, put out Fate magazine, but he did it under a different name. Now, Curtis uh, Fuller uh, was one of the publishers. He had also been in, from the Chicago area and worked on pulp magazines there. But Ray Palmer used a different name because he was still working for Ziff Davis and he didn't want to know, uh, want them to know that uh, he was moonlighting. So uh, Fate magazine uh, continued to publish some of the Shaver articles. And uh, once the uh, Kenneth Arnold uh, sighting took place on June 24th, 1947, they actually even had Kenneth Arnold uh, write an article for the magazine, which is in their first issue of Fate that was published in 1948. And over the years, uh, Ray uh, Palmer uh, became a, um, uh, I, I guess, one of the leading, the only publisher, major publisher in the uh, in the field. And in addition to Fate magazine, he had spinoff publications called Flying Saucers from Other Worlds, Mystic Magazine, uh, Forum, Hidden Worlds, and so forth. And I enjoyed the magazine so much. It was fairly difficult to, to, uh, to purchase. You kind of really had a hunt uh, for it. It was 35 cents in those days. Uh, <laughs> it started out, hey, yeah, there, can you imagine a magazine? No, 30? no. Uh, now, now I pay uh, uh, $11.50 for the 14 times. Right. You know, I mean, that's about... That's about that's about the only thing that's uh, published in uh, in English anymore that is available on you know in Barnes and Noble. So I, I wrote a column. I started writing a column for a Palmer called "On the Trail of the Flying Saucers," and and that kind of just uh, started my uh, professional uh, uh, publishing uh, uh, career. You know, writing that would have been in about 1965 uh, or so. In and I've been doing it in one form or another, uh, you know, uh, over the years. I, I was one of the few people before there was uh, Whitley Schreiber or Bud Hopkins. I was I was was on the trail of the flying saucers. I traveled all over the country at my own expense, <coughs> and, uh, and and did some lecturing and went on radio and TV uh, shows. I was one of the few people that was not a contactee who was talking up the uh, the uh, the subject. What I you have had such an interesting uh, multi-dimensional life. I mean, you've had all these different careers and experiences, and you've met some really interesting characters along yeah. the way. And I wish you know, I mean, Palmer and and uh, Mosley and Gray Barker. I'm sure that was and Keel. You know, I mean, it's like all of those. Oh, yeah. Well, Keel, guys. Keel was a neighbor. Keel was a neighbor of mine. Uh, and in fact, uh, I go to the movies every week down here at Kipps Bay. And he lived in the apartment building upstairs, so he was a late nighter, uh, like I was, and I'd go over there in the uh, in the evening, and we just sit around and chat. And and you know, I didn't take notes, and a lot of times we just bullshitted about stuff that didn't even really have anything to do with uh, with the uh, UFOs. I, we used to go to the movies together and eat uh, lunch. Oh, he was fun. not. He was not a. When I hear that music, so that means we've got to go to break. We we should know better. We're naughty. I mean, I'm here with Tim Beckley. We're going to take a break, and we will be right back. You're listening. You are listening to. You're listening to UFO Classified with Erica Luke's, where the truth isn't hidden beneath the black lines of a sharpie. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> to be on with Erica, call seven zero two four two five. 9230. That's 702 425 9230. Worldwide callers use Skype name KCOR Radio. Radio contact. Share your thoughts on the show on Twitter by using hashtag KCOR. Or head over to the live chat at KCORradio.com. The audience goes nuts. And now, your host of UFO Classified. Are you ready? Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. Welcome back to UFO Classified. I want to give a shout out to all my friends in chat. A special thanks to Northern UFOs for all of your support, getting things on YouTube, and all of you that have become uh, Patreons to support the show. I really, really appreciate it. It means the world to me that you uh, donate and help keep the show on the air. It's it, I 
Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. I want to also thank Tina Marie, who is an incredible station manager, and she keeps track of me and produces a great show. And I mean, honestly, she should, her paycheck should be much higher, I'm telling you, just to keep track of me and my goings-ons behind the scenes. As I, I, In fact, I'll have to have Tina on the show and we can talk about some of our special moments off, off the air. That would be fabulous. But I'm here tonight with somebody who also has a show on KCOR and it is, it's fun. I've been on it before. Lots of interesting people. Tim Green Beckley, Timothy Green Beckley, has been described as the Hunter Thompson of ufology in, in the horror world. He's known as Mr. Creepo. And I think that, uh, yes. Tim, you know, you've probably got some other names out there to describe you. Oh, it's just... <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, oh I, I'm, I'm sure I do. Yeah, no, 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 no doubt. Well, you know, uh, uh, ufology is kind of a a mixed uh, bag. If people don't agree with uh, uh, you know your philosophy, and I don't know if I necessarily have a uh, uh, you know I'm not uh, deeply embedded into uh, um, anything. I mean, there are some things that I believe more heavily into than others. Like uh, uh, people always want to chat me about Roswell, and I don't know as if I, 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 I as far as I'm concerned, I don't think that there is a heck of a lot of evidence that Roswell was an extraterrestrial craft. Now, something did uh, obviously happen there in the July of 1947. Uh, perhaps uh, I landed because it was just around my birthday when I was born. That would so, make sense. Uh, they, they could have they they just, uh, you know, heaved me out of the, uh, the ship or something like that. And, uh, but uh, I, I've, I've felt over the years that uh, some of these UFO uh, crashes and some of the uh, UFO events that took place were actually manipulated on the part of the government. Oh, no. Uh, Say it isn't so. Yeah. Okay. Well, I believe now that, uh, uh, you know, uh, in 19, after World War II, uh, the, uh, the government bought over all these basically former Nazis uh, from Germany uh, who were scientists, uh, who were working on uh, rocket propulsion and God knows what other kinds of forms of propulsion. And they were testing uh, rockets and, and vehicles and other kinds of craft in that part of the country. And uh, I, I think there's a good possibility that uh, one of these uh, the craft uh, crashed in uh, Roswell, perhaps uh, some uh, exotic uh, vehicle uh, using other, some other propulsion uh, system because now uh, the Germans, if you know the story of the development of uh, of flying discs there uh apparently going back as far as 1919 uh the uh, german uh, mediums uh actually five women uh nine women actually that uh, were channeling information that purported to be from uh, another star system and this information had to do with propulsion ufo propulsion of course they didn't use, call them ufos in those days and uh, they we're doing automatic writing and, and writing this down and then turning the information over to the uh, uh, German uh, Nazi uh, scientist uh, for developing these uh, craft, which they were trying to turn into uh, weapons of mass uh, destruction. So I believe that there's a good possibility that these objects, uh, this object or, or objects that crashed uh, outside of Roswell was one of these German built craft. And the government would rather have you believe that they were from some other planet. If you're going to believe in anything at all, you should believe that UFOs are extraterrestrial uh, and not made here on this uh, Earth because they would have to admit that they were actually in collusion with these uh, Nazi uh, uh, scientists, butchers, whatever you wanted to call them, you know, murderers, uh, some of them. And and so, uh, you know, they, they might have even... Uh, uh, were behind organizations like the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, which was Major Kehoe's uh, a group that uh, oh, first organized around 1950, uh, early 1950s in Washington, D.C. And, you know, they were always uh, had these uh, uh, pi uh, reports by pilots and police officers and, uh, and pushed the extraterrestrial theory that these things were from uh, some other uh, solar system. But there was other evidence, too, that uh, these things might have been under German uh, control. Now, uh, the uh, George, uh, George Adamski, of course, was prob is probably the most famous of all contactees. 
And, uh, of course, he's kind of uh, uh, held by the nuts and bolts people, the serious ufologists, and, and very low regard. Even though today, Eric, he still has a, a quite a following all over the uh, uh, all over the world. I mean, he was the contactee that got the most uh, attention. And I guess if you were going to say believable, uh, perhaps the uh, the most believable. But if you investigate the history of his claims, and I've spent quite a, a bit of time uh, doing so. Uh, in fact, we have a book called Pioneers from Space, which is a reprint of a book that he did in about 19... 19- 45 before he claimed contact with the orthon from the you know another uh, planet now some people say uh, well the uh, the alien in that book was uh, jesus christ and some people say well he just exchanged uh, a jesus for a spaceman when that became more popular but adamski was involved in the metaphysical uh, scene in california going back to the 1930s and this is something that a lot of people don't uh, realize and the George Adamski uh, groups and supporters have tried to sweep this back under the cover. Uh, he had a, a, a commune. That's the best way I can describe it. Uh, in fact, there's a, a long article in the uh, Los Angeles uh, newspaper from about 1935 in which he describes how he's uh, trying to build this community and that they're going to have a repl- replica of the uh, Great Pyramid on the, on the property. And wow. then a couple of years later, he was running uh, the, the Tibetan a Tibetan society, and he put out a little booklet about his beliefs in uh, uh, Tibetan philosophy and claims that he actually spent years in Tibet as a, as a student, which I don't believe at all. I, there's no evidence to support that, uh, that theory whatsoever. Uh, but then little by little, you know, the UFO started to take it, and he added that to his, uh, uh, his work and his knowledge and what he was trying to push. Now, I do think that he had some uh, legitimate experiences. Like uh, there was an incident uh, in about 1947 where there were a group of people that he, he was a short order cook. He had a, a, a little restaurant on the hill up to Mount, uh, going up to Mount Palomar. Now, he told people he was on Mount Palomar, which gave the impression that he was an astronomer or something, but he really, he really wasn't. He was a uh, a, a chef in a little restaurant, okay, which is all right, no problem with uh, uh, with uh, that. But they did have some legitimate uh, sightings, and some of the early photographs, I think, were were uh, you know uh, real enough. But the uh, the uh, the incident that he's best known for was the one that happened, I think, it was 1952 or 53, where uh, the object landed in the desert, and he walked off uh, towards it, and uh, uh, eight people watching through uh, binoculars supposedly. Uh, saw him uh, communicate with this uh, tall, uh, good-looking Venusian with long blonde hair and uh, kind of the you know the Nordic uh, type of uh, uh, alien. But here's the interesting uh, fact that ties this in with the German saucer uh, secrets. Uh, George Hunt Williamson, who actually uh, had a uh, background as a uh, uh, working for a uh, uh, a Nazi uh, organization, but that's another story. Uh, he took he took some plaster of Paris, uh, and they, uh, where the uh, spaceship had landed, and the alien, the, this uh, being that uh, uh, Adamski identified as Orthon, had left some impressions in the ground uh, with the with the the boots that he had on. And George Hunt Williamson came with the plaster of Paris, and they made an imprint of the of the boots. And lo and behold, in the middle of the uh, the plaster of Paris, what do you have but a swastika? Now, why why would a Venusian, uh, a man from another planet who looked like uh, one of the the Ger- German uh, Aryan uh, types, be wearing boots w- with a swastika in it? And if you look at Adamski's book, it's right there. It's not something that I'm I'm making uh, up. I, I mean that that just is very very strange. And also, some of the early contactees uh, claimed that they overheard the so-called space people speaking in German. Well, why would aliens uh, come to Earth? You're more likely to speak, uh, uh, you know, ancient Atlantean or something like that. Why would you speak in, in, in old-fashioned German? It just it doesn't make sense. So I, I think some of these, these uh, craft, at least in the early days and even now, that there was a spinoff uh, of uh, some other sort of uh, technology, the secret space program, uh, where there is another form of technology that's being used, and perhaps maybe we've even established bases on the moon, and the public be damned that they should know about any of this stuff. 
it's bizarre, it's weird, and it's crazy. But uh, you know, I mean, it's a it, it's a theory, and it's uh, it's workable because we really don't have any evidence that these things are uh, are extraterrestrial. I mean, right. as far as I can tell. Uh, you know, and I, and I think I mean you've brought up a lot of of great points and things that I found interesting over the years, looking through my archives and seeing the way you know you look at the ads in some of these older UFO magazines, and it's it's there there are religious factions, there are you know oh, yes. there's political ideology and different things, and then you hear about a Damsky and you hear about yeah. some of the people that were in play at the time, and they have very yeah. uh, interesting ideas, and they were well, you uh, know they were they were accused of being communists. Because they believed in a cashless society and talked uh, about uh, doing away with nuclear weapons, the FBI actually kept kept tabs on these individuals because they thought they they were uh, uh, promoting socialism, heaven forbid, and 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 uh, and, and communism. So uh, they were under the uh, the, the scrutiny of uh, J. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover. Now I think uh, our buddy uh, Nick Redford has even written. Uh, uh, we've touched on the subject before, but I think he's even done uh, maybe a book on uh, some of this uh, information that's been released under the uh, Freedom of uh, Information uh, Act, and, mm-hmm. and that's kind of that's kind of preposterous. I, I mean, talk about a, a waste of uh, of funds to to send. Uh, you know, there's there's your men in black. You know, uh, uh, what do the FBI kind of look like? The stereotypical men in black, right? Sitting in the audience, taking uh, taking notes while the Dempsey's up there raving and ranting about going to Mars and Saturn. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting, but I want to ask you, I mean, you were, you were involved in this but from, you know, your young life, your adult, young adult yep. life on, and you got into this and then you started associating with some very interesting, colorful people. Did, at what point in time did you step back and say, wait a minute, we're being fed a narrative that isn't correct? By our well, government. I mean, you know, well, you know, okay, now, uh, Jim Mosley, uh, who published Saucer News, now at one point, he had a, a, a circulation of about 10,000 uh, subscribers, which in those days, well, uh, today uh, there isn't a magazine that has 10,000 subscribers, nowhere near it. But uh, uh, he had a, a, a professional zine, and you know how he got most of his subscribers? was. He used to appear on the, the Long John show. Of course, the uh, Long John, uh, you know, was the originator of the all-night uh, paranormal UFO talk show, and long before Art Bell was was around. And uh, he, Long John, had a, a, a tr- tremendous audience. He was heard actually, uh, even though he, he broadcast out of WOR in New York, uh, had a, a five thousand watt station, a clear channel, so that you could hear him in thirty states. And I know for a fact, I was on, the first time I was on Long John, I got 400 letters. Well, today, if you get 14 letters, you're doing, uh, you're doing uh, uh, you know, uh, good. And he would also appear on uh, a t- a television talk shows. He used to go on, there was a fellow by the name of Chuck McCann, who uh, had a show for children with a, uh, a like a Charlie McCarthy type of uh, 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 dummy. Uh, ventriloquist uh, act and he would go on there and he'd get postcards and all from from children you know that were in like uh, you know third grade or something like that but in those days it was like two dollars to subscribe to the magazine so he he built up a, a subscription list and then i came along and i didn't want to staple and collate anymore so he hired me as managing editor and took my 1500 uh, uh, subscribers and combined it with his uh, circulation so that made it a little bit over 10,000. And then he had a giant UFO convention. It was the largest UFO convention ever held at the uh, Hotel Commodore in New York. He had over 8,000 people uh, over a, a particular uh, weekend. I think it was celebrating, uh, this would have been 1967, so the 30th anniversary of uh, uh, Kenneth Arnold's uh, uh, sighting or something. And uh, everybody showed up. I mean, he had a, a really deep... Uh, a list of uh, speakers and all, including Roy Finnis, who was the star of the TV show The Invaders at the time. And he had a woman who claimed to be from Venus. There was a gal, her name was Vi Venus, uh, who had been on uh, the Long John show like uh, two or three nights in a row. And she claimed 
that she had actually come down here from another planet, landed in landed in Central Park, and had swapped souls with with somebody here who wanted to commit suicide, and th- that that person went off to another planet. It was one of the original what we call walk-ins. Okay, starred seedlings, mm-hmm. and, and it was at the height of the UFO uh, flap, like in Michigan and, and all these. Uh, it, it was the the subject was getting a tremendous amount of play in the uh, in the uh, media, and and so just a couple of announcements and an ad brought in this huge crowd. I mean, we we couldn't keep the we couldn't keep the line straight. People were sneaking in through side doors and all this stuff, you know. But it, it, in those days, there was a, a real great enthusiasm. Of, more or less a, right. a, a little bit more of a novelty than it is today, you know? Well, and, and I mean, uh, from what I understand, uh, wasn't Edward Condon in the audience? Yeah, you're right. Absolutely uh, right. He's, he sat there and uh, um, took notes, and he interviewed people like uh, Fra- Dr. Frank Strangers and Howard Menger, who was our local version of the uh, of George Adamski. Very nice gentleman. He's married to Connie uh, Menger. They uh, later on moved to Florida, and and his his uh, experiences I, I could actually support a little bit uh, uh, more because something strange was happening out there in uh, Highbridge, New Jersey. He he lived about Howard and his wife uh, lived on a farm where they had actually had some uh, UFO experiences where he was a when he was a kid uh, growing up. You know, he had UFOs came over, and he and his brother saw these things, and then there was a landing where he met a, a woman supposedly from some other planet, you know, very attractive uh, lady. And um, over the years, he claimed that he had these visitors. They were landing in his apple orchard, and, and people that would come to visit would actually see strange things going on in the back of the house. Okay, well, I talked to some of these people, and they were even on the Long John Show, and it was kind of iffy. Uh, Jim Mosley always said that the photographs were fake because – Howard, uh, uh, as a livelihood, was a sign painter. So he painted up some mock UFOs with, uh, you know, Daigle paint or something like that and photographed them. That's a possibility. But he also had photos of, uh, uh, of these uh, space people kind of in silhouette form. Uh, in fact, if anybody's interested, I have a book uh, called uh, UFO Repeaters, uh, Seeing is Believing the Camera Doesn't Lie. Uh, you can find that on Amazon. And that's got like uh, 15 different people who are UFO repeaters that have experiences over and over and over again. Like Stella Lansing. Howard. Stella oh, Lansing. Stella Lansing. Yeah. Wonderful lady. I, I knew Stella very well. And in fact, I have a, a story about Stella Lansing and the, and the APRO. But um, uh, Howard Menger, he, he, he had something going for him there. I remember I, I had a, a phone call one time uh, from after I was on the Long Gun Show. There was this gentleman who called me and said, listen, I have something to tell you. And he told me the story about how he had driven out to Howard's uh, place, his farm, without letting anybody know, knowing he was going. He didn't know Howard or anything like that, but he had heard him on the, on the radio. So he went there and he parked somewhere in, in the, uh, the field behind the house and he had missing time. And this was before there was missing time. I mean, we're talking about the late 60s, early 70s. Something had happened because he had been sitting on the hood of the car waiting to see these craft. And when he came to, the sun was up. Okay, so that's pretty unusual, but it doesn't prove anything. Maybe he just passed out from the uh, uh, it being so late. But he, he kept calling me because he said that there was something pulling him. And now this was before the movie Close, en- uh, uh, Close Encounters. And if you, you remember in the film, uh, what was his name? And, and, uh, Nori, the, the, the truck driver who was making the, uh, uh, the, uh, the mountain, uh, the Devil's Tower out of the mashed yeah, potatoes. Yeah, Richard Drivers. I, can't, I should know Richard what his Drivers. character's yeah, name yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Nori, I think. But then, uh, uh, okay. Uh, anyway, so uh, there was this uh, the fellow, and he called me. And apparently he was getting some kind of messages to build something. Now, he never cli- uh, uh, quite explained what it was, but he left his family and he bought a trailer and he started filling it with, it, it sounded like kind of abstract metal sculptures or junk or something like that. And this is what the, the space people were telling him to do, all because he, he you know, had this missing time experience. Uh, behind Howard Menger's house. And then there were uh, Dr. Bethel Eric Schwartz, who was a, uh, uh, a psych, uh, 
psychiatrist who had written about uh, UFOs and and done examinations of people and found that that they were uh, that they were stable and they did not have mental illnesses and so forth and so on. He actually uh, had to spend some time interviewing Howard and some of the witnesses and had some experiences uh, there his, as well. In fact, he was the uh, the individual who. Um, investigated Stella Lansing's uh, case that you just uh, mentioned. No. Well, and, you know, uh, I would love to talk to you after you get back from the next break, because she's always yeah. been somebody who's fascinated well, I, me, and I nobody just, really I, talks I about her. I, I discovered Stella Lansing, and I, I have a... If it wasn't for me, there would be no Stella Lansing. Uh, wow. uh, for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I pioneered this uh, stuff. You know, I, I was always... People say, well, you know, you, you, you know some of these people and they're real wackos. yeah. But I managed to, without insulting people, I, I managed to, uh, you know, people say, oh, you're the great fence setter. And yeah, I would, I would say that I am because you don't learn anything by, uh, you know, in, 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 in insulting people or, or calling them a fraud. Now, my philosophy on this subject is unless somebody claims to be a great cult leader and has the, uh, you know, is the only source of information like Billy Meyer, who I totally uh, detest because it's a way it's a waste of time. And the photos are obviously, uh, you know, as phony as you could possibly uh, get. Uh, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you half a chance and listen to, uh, you know, what you have to say. And if I don't believe you whatsoever, I just won't have you on the program or I won't sit down with you. I'll just uh, I'll pass you by. But I'm not going to go out of my way to, you know, to insult you. And there. There is that uh, quantity in the field of, of people who uh, he doesn't believe what I believe, so I'm not going to uh, uh, heed him any uh, attention. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like me, you know. Okay, so I, I've had some dealings with people who are maybe borderline, but I've also done a heck of a lot of good, and I've, I've been out here for 50 years promoting uh, the, uh, the field without being uh, judgmental, and I've probably provided more guests uh, to uh, other, uh, you know, uh, produce shows actually without any pay or compensation or mention my book or, or something like that, you know, uh, than, than anybody else, you know, because if somebody like if somebody's on my show and I think that, uh, you know, they have something worthwhile to say and they're not getting the, the attention that they deserve, I'll even send out a little note to, uh, to my, uh, you know, my buddies that do programs and say, have this person on, you know, they're, they'll make a good guess. Uh, That's awesome. And, and, and that, yeah. I mean, that it, it is, it is a hard line to, I mean, we, we all have our different opinions and there are always critics coming at you from every angle. And, and it, it's just like at the end of the day, none of us, no. <laughs> this is a, this yeah. is like the wild west and yes, yes, we all uh -huh. make mistakes and some of us are, you know, yeah. grounded and humble enough to admit that and say, uh, uh, this is where we've gone right or we've gone wrong and different things. And it's just, it's, I don't know, I'm going to give you a, a lot of credit for doing what you've done yeah. over the past few decades and, and getting people's information out there and making them feel comfortable. Uh, because that's, well, I, at the know, end of the day, I, that's right, important. Right now, right, right now I'm, I'm sitting here with two book, books in my lap and they're so heavy, uh, my uh, leg is falling asleep. Oh dear. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, my uh, one of the uh, T Tim Schwartz does some of our books, and uh, there's another fellow in California, uh, BK, oh, Mister Kern. Uh, uh, well, uh, well, uh, I know. I hear uh, the music uh, again. We're slacking. I hear it. I hear it. They're sucking, they're sucking uh, me up into the spaceship. They are. Uh, I know. Okay. Well, we'll yeah. be back after. You know, you, you have a little moment on the spaceship. Yeah. I'm Eric Luke yeah, here yeah. with with Tim Beckley. We will be back. Listen very carefully. Welcome back to the second half of UFO Classified. Again, it's always great to see my friends in chat. Ben, Benjamin Hyde, I'll be calling you on Sunday. I look forward to that. All of you, thank you for supporting the show and and doing the best to promote it. You know that I'm here because I am passionate about the subject. I want to preserve history. I want to make sure a younger generation has a good platform to get in here and make uh, good calls instead of being fed a line where we constantly have to learn the same lessons over and over and over again. It is a it can be a deep and murky subject, and with all the disinformation, especially uh, today that we're seeing in play, it makes it even more challenging. But there is something incredible here, and it is worthy of study. 
study and respect. I am here tonight with Tim Beckley, who has a show on my favorite radio station, KCOR. It's on Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. His co-host is Tim Schwartz. I've been on the show before exploring the bazaar. I love it. It's fun, funny. I have a great time. And he, uh, Tim has also been in this game for decades since the 60s and is authored how many books have how many books have you written well you know i don't know uh <laughs> we have uh, we have a, uh yeah, i'm a publisher so uh, i i always put my name somewhere there so it's kind of a you know a brand you either like me mm-hmm. or you you dislike me but you know what you get when you you kind of order a, a book and uh, if you're into it well that's fine if you're not well you know read something else but um uh, how many books I have written? I don't know. We have over 300 books up on Amazon, but they're by other uh, authors like uh, Brad Steiger, Reverend Barry Downing, uh, T. Lobson Grampa. Uh, I can't even remember all the uh, all the authors. You know, back in the 1980s, anything that you published in this field knew. A kind of I call it alternative uh, or uh, press. Uh, I don't know what what it's really considered because people always complain. Man, well, you go into a bookstore and there's no UFO section. No, because they're still going by the Dewey Decimal System, right? And and there's a, 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 when Dewey was around, and I don't know exactly when that was. We're probably around uh, 1902 or something. There were no UFOs. I, I mean, so. It does. Uh, it's next to the computer books or something uh, like that. Even when you go into Barnes and Noble, now it now it would be under spiritual or new age or religious studies or something like that. There's never been a UFO section, and people complain about it. But that's just the way it is. Uh, okay, but in the 1980s. There was a proliferation of independent bookstores. I had a mailing list of 4,400 bookstores, most of which specialized in alternative and new age uh, media. I mean, every town in America had at least one crystal shop or one new age uh, shop, some of which carried UFO books and some of which didn't. Now, I remember an incident. I was in Sedona and, uh, I had just started really publishing. I think I'd put out my first hardcover book. It was called Demon Lovers by Brad Steiger. And I went into a place called the Eye of the Vortex. No longer been, uh, no longer around, not for years. They didn't last uh, very uh, long because most metaphysical bookstores are pushing one particular theme and you can't push a, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 open a bookstore and just uh, want to sell books by the yoga pushananda or something like that. You know, you got to be a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, uh, broad minded. Anyway, right. I had published this book by Brad Steiger, Demon Lovers, and I went in to the uh, to the uh, bookstore, figuring that I would introduce myself. And and the uh, the two ladies who ran the store, the Eye of the Vortex, said, "We don't like you in here." And I said, "Why is that? Because you published Demon Lovers by Brad Steiger." You know, and I, I realized that that was, uh, uh, you know, like uh, there was always going to be, uh, you know, some uh, store owner or proprietor who wouldn't carry your books because they didn't. It was guilt by association again. They didn't like you because uh, you published books by Brad Steiger or had once met Anton LaVey or belonged to a witch's uh, coven in New York or made horror movies. Although uh, you mentioned off the air a project that I was involved in years ago. <laughs> I, yes, <laughs> I was. I wasn't. I make. I make no secret. I make no secret of this. And and we are. Uh, we are not uh, uh, governed by the FCC here. I as I understand. This, it. That's true. That's a good thing. <laughs> okay. And, and and we are broadcast out of uh, Las Vegas. Okay. I was the original movie critic for Hustler magazine. In fact, I did most of the legwork uh, in, on the East Coast here for Larry Flint. In fact, I one time chased Blaze Star, the stripper who claimed who had a uh, extramarital affair with uh, John F. Kennedy, through the lobby of a well-known hotel, uh, topless. She was topless, not me. Uh, and, and taking taking photographs, 
And, and so I, I did their movie reviews and, and, and I got in with the, the wrong crowd. Ha ha. Okay. And, and I, uh, I was, uh, I also did another magazine, uh, one of my editorial chores called adult cinema review. So I was meeting all the uh, people that were in the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the adult movie uh, business, some of, some of whom were were perhaps a little shady and surly, surly, but most of them who were not really. They were actually just trying to make a living like uh, everybody else, and and had uh, uh, you know d- different uh, uh, feelings and morals maybe than uh, the Christian right might uh, might uh, have. In fact, a girlfriend of mine once changed herself to the pillar of a building. Because they were having a sex conference, nothing to do with sex, but uh, you, you know, j- just an entertainment type of uh, uh, thing. And the police came to raid the place because I think they were selling like uh, adult products and, and and condoms. And they chained themselves together in front of the pillar to the building that they they had rented the uh, uh, you know the the room to have their event uh, in. So I, I I knew all these these people and and I got involved in making uh, well reviewing films and and, and uh, I worked for a couple of film companies, uh, as a, a publicist, they would give me a, 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 a trailer, you know, a, a, like a two minute trailer for the film. And I'd cut up the, uh, the 35 millimeter uh, footage and I would go around to the men's magazines and leave them off uh, uh, with a press release that I would write. And they would uh, uh, run the press release and the photographs because they were getting it for free. See, and, and that way I also ended up doing UFO articles for these magazines are getting paid five, six, seven hundred dollars because I would throw in a pitch for UFOs while I was there. And so some of these magazines that would never think of printing a, a UFO piece like Genesis and Gallery uh, were doing color pictorials on the uh, on the uh, the subject. So I kind of got into that, you know, into uh, doing uh, the uh, uh, the men's magazines things. And I made in 1984, I co-produced a film called Driller, which was the adult takeoff of michael jackson's thriller and this played in uh, uh adult theaters around the country and it also played in um uh, oh, oh uh, drive-in uh, theaters you know as a uh, midnight uh, the shows on uh, um uh, weekends and things uh, like that you know like uh, next it was on a double bill i think in a couple of places with the rocky horror show although we were a little hard, we were harder than the rocky horror show but Rocky Horror Show was actually, we had singing and dancing and uh, uh, adult, uh, adult uh, zombies and a, uh, 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 a werewolf. In fact, we got banned in Canada because they said we were pro- promoting bestiality because we had a, an actor dressed up like a werewolf in the, uh, in the film. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so uh, you know, I, I, yeah, I ended up doing that. So, so, so what? In fact, we had a midnight screening and we had the... Uh, the 30th anniversary of the release of the film and some of the actual people that were in it who believe me are not in adult films anymore, uh, you know, it showed up and we had an interesting uh, evening uh, talking about the film. And it was one of the films that got a lot of attention, even in, cause I knew all these people like at the tabloid. So I'd call them up and I'd say, Hey, I got this film coming out. And they'd say, Oh, it's a Michael Jackson, you know, spoof. So they'd play it up on the cover with stills of the photographs and stuff. You know, it was the number one adult movie, an actual movie. I mean, we spent $100,000 to make this. Uh, the number one uh, adult movie in, in America for three weeks in a row. <laughs> there you go. Dang. Wow. <laughs> Dang. I, you uh, you know, I have, so, that's... But, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't know. You know, I, I never, I, I've never hidden that as a fact. I don't think anybody right. in, uh, in the UFO field has ever really been overcritical and tor- uh, and towards me. Some people said I couldn't act, but the hell with them. I mean, uh, some people said I couldn't sing, and I actually got on the stage a couple of times. Uh, and uh, we had a, we had a, a group uh, in uh, uh, Arizona. Uh, I sang with them a couple of times. It was the uh, UFO X band or something like that with Susan Gordon and. Jim Delatoso and uh, and uh, Fred Bell before he passed away, and we even had Patrick Moraes come in and, and, and jam with us till like five o'clock in the morning. He was the keyboard player for, um, uh, let me think, um, uh, uh, Moody Blues, and then uh, was it Yes, yeah, 
kind of not my kind of music. Well, you'd have to. Uh, you ever had Jim Delatelso on the uh, the, the show? He's a, no. a fascinating fellow. Yeah, I yeah. would love he, to he him. Well, he uh, I I love Jim even if he believes that the uh, the Billy Myers uh, photos or some of them uh, were illegitimate. You know, but oh. uh, I, hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. He, but he yeah. knew. You know, he knows Shirley MacLaine and all. You know, yeah, he's he's quite a. Well, he's he worked on the Phoenix Lights. He did. Quite yeah, a bit yeah, on that. yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he's doing. He's doing. Other, he's not so active in the UFO uh, field, you know. But if I ever get to a Tucson, which I like to, to do, I I have I have a bigger my 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 home away from home would be Tucson. I mean, I got I got a, a you know a a, a a a group of people there that'll always come and uh, uh, say hello and have a drink and who knows well. Uh, yeah, yeah. In fact, one of our uh, our, our biggest uh, uh, fans for the show, if you could call it that, uh, is an associate of mine, is uh, uh, Jean, and uh, she's you know called up uh, Charlotte. She's called up the uh, the show several times, and she's kind of my photographer when I'm uh, when I'm out there. We we go to um, uh, you know Sedona and uh, take uh, photos of uh, uh, Tom uh, Dongo. Do you know? Have you had Tom on the show? No, I haven't. I oh, haven't. wonderful! He's got he's got scrapbooks full of photographs of all kinds of uh, the Blue Man, and and he was involved with the Bradshaw Ranch, yes, which was uh, even even a little bit before the um, uh, Skinwalker uh, Ranch around the same time. You know, now here's one thing that I found out: I, I'm working on a book. If we can get the last five chapters uh, together, because again, it's over 500 pages or 400 pages, and we kind of lost uh, the uh, synchronicity of the. Uh, of, of the book, I put the wrong chapter in the, the wrong order, or something like that. And the the uh, graphics department has gone a little crazy over this. But uh, I, I'm doing a book that'll be out before uh, Christmas. In fact, it might be out in a week or so. It's called UFOs uh, DJ Vu. Uh, it's all about the places that you can go and have repeated UFO experiences. Now, it's not going to happen on a, on every given night, but we're talking about Skinwalker Ranch, the Bradshaw Ranch. We're t- talking about the San Luis uh, Valley in uh, uh, Colorado that uh, Chris O'Brien, of course, has been uh, involved in there. We've got a long interview. It's, it's a huge book, and it's got it's from all over the world. I mean, I sit here, and you know, that's why people say, well, these books are so big. Yeah, because I, I refuse to finish with a book until I, I've said everything that I have to say. And the books are the books are like magazines because that's kind of my background in this uh, field uh, has been as a magazine publisher, and so I like to have uh, different diversified uh, opinions and concepts and, and ideas, uh, not just my own thinking, my own warp thinking on the uh, on the subject. You know, I like to get other people involved, and and we've got some great uh, contributors who who uh, you know I can always depend on, like Scott Corrales who uh, it takes care of investigating and gathering uh, and collating all the reports from the Hispanic communities, you know, Puerto Rico and uh, uh, South America and and so forth. And uh, Hercules, uh, who I don't know if he's been on your show, he's uh, uh, into no. uh, ancient, ancient astronauts and Greek mythology. He actually claims that the Greek gods from Atlantis come down and sometimes they even uh, do a little hikey-pikey with Earth people. And because who can resist them? Because you know what the gods of uh, of uh, uh, of Mount Olympus look like. You know Thor and uh, Zeus. And well, so forth. that's yeah. fine for me. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll let, uh, I, if we go, if we go, if we go to uh, one of the uh, Greek islands, I'll introduce you. I'm thank sure. You, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're yeah. Okay. Not that, let's... Need, not that you need any introduction. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. Very good. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I have to ask you because you know you're you're talking about the Bradshaw Ranch and and yep. UFO repeaters. This I've got, which I've yep. got in my hand. Seeing is believing. Oh, the camera really? doesn't lie. Oh, oh, yes. Is that not a good book? I mean, it is. You, know, you, yeah. can't, you, you, you can't say uh, okay. I mean, like people say, do you believe everybody uh, story that's in there? Well, you know, some people I give a little bit more uh, uh, depth to than uh, than uh, others, but. You're going to ask me about Stella Lansing, I bet, because there's a chapter in there on Stella Lansing. Well, you know what? I mean, I came across her a few years ago, and, it, and nobody yes. really talks a lot about her, but I found her to be very interesting. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I would love to hear it. I would love to hear it. Stella Lansing. 
And this goes back to, to the days of Jim Mosley. Okay. About 1960, eh, I'm going to say 68. Eh, it could be off a year or so. A uh, Jim would have uh, weekly meetings or monthly meetings uh, in time uh, in a hotel around Times Square. And he would have, you know, people were into lecture that you didn't have the, the travel channel at all. If you wanted to hear about UFOs, you would go to the meetings and you'd pay. I, I think one night, Gray Barker was in one room. I was still a kid. Gray Barker was in one room and Ivan Sanderson in the other. And we paid 75 cents to get in. Can you imagine that, right? And um, so he, he had he had speakers. I even spoke for him when I was a kid. I, I remember I was about 17 years old and they had a little room that held like 60 people. And they were crammed in there. They had to get a room that held a hundred. That's how, how uh, you know, impressed uh, I was at those times. But people actually would come to hear me talk about this. And um, oh, okay, so he, Jim was always busy, you know, like running around, uh, you know, setting up the uh, the book table or or taking money at the door or or putting out folding chairs or, or what have you, introducing the speakers. So I was kind of his uh, his uh, assistant. And uh, if you can't get to Jim, the closest thing you would get was to talk to me. So I get this, uh, I get this lady comes up to me and she introduces herself as Stella Lansing. And she tells me that she's had all these weird experiences and she would like to make a presentation of her films. Now, Stella would go out at night with her a cheap little uh, eight millimeter uh, camera and she would point the uh, camera at the sky and when the film was developed, there would be all sorts of, well, what would you call them? Uh, objects on the, on the photograph. They weren't necessarily UFO shaped. Some of them were, but there were images of people and images of clocks and things that she hadn't seen, but they were there. And the thing that made it so unusual is that when you're using the eight millimeter, you know the, uh, the uh, if you know about filmmaking, you know the uh, when you play the film, it goes through the projector at a certain speed, projects it on the wall. But she had the images were actually appearing in between the the frames of the uh, you know where the sprockets are on, on the eight millimeter uh, film, where you shouldn't even get any anything on there. And then years later, when she took this silent uh, uh, film and put it on the video, voices su suddenly started appearing, and it was a silent camera. So how did the voices get on there? So she had these, uh, she was a UFO repeater. She had these experiences over and over again, and she wanted to make her case known to the public. So Jim wouldn't talk to her because he was too busy, and he was more into nuts and bolts uh, and didn't think too much of her psychic uh, ex he considered it psychic. So he said, you talk to her. Anyway, she convinced me that she ought to have her time uh, on the podium. And I talked him into giving her a, an hour at a future uh, uh, weekly uh, meeting of the Saucer and Unexplained Celestial Events Research Society, which for short is Saucers, S-A-U-C-E-R-S. -E okay, that was the uh, the group that held the uh, the meetings. And she came and she made this presentation. And, and uh, you know, it... it uh, I, I, hey, I, I knew her pretty well. We'd go out for dinner. She'd always have something new to tell me and have some new footage. Okay, APRO, the, uh, this uh, somewhat prestigious uh, group, uh, there was NICAP and APRO. Uh, NICAP was into uh, nuts and bolts sightings by pilots and police officers and uh, astronomers and uh, uh, into breaking through the uh, government secrecy, where APRO, who was down in Tucson, they they were uh, collecting uh, reports from all over the world uh, of humanoid sightings and, and and things that were hostility cases and, and and things. And okay, they had a meeting in Baltimore in 1970, and they had a closed door presentation that was only for the board of advisors uh, for APRO. So Jim and Gray Barker and myself, we decided we wanted to find out what this presentation was. So we got into the room before we were thrown out because we were not. It was by special invitation only, and their present, their the person that was presenting in that room was Stella Lansing. They thought that they had discovered Stella Lansing when she had actually spoken for Jim Mosley's group about a year and a half before, and they kicked us out of the room because they didn't want us to hear what she had to say. Anyway, you could find her whole story. 
uh, in the UFO uh, repeaters. The camera doesn't lie. And if you go to my YouTube channel, Mr. UFO's Secret Files, where we have 400 uh, interviews, most of the interviews from uh, all the, the interviews from our programs in Exploring the Bazaar, if you type in uh, Stella Lansing on our page, you will find uh, a 10-minute uh, interview when she was on Unsolved Sightings, where she's actually showing the, the videos and they're analyzing them and so forth. It's worth a trip over to Mr. UFO's Secret Files. I would say. I mean, so did you, I mean, what do you make of, of that? Do you think that there are people that just have yes. special yes, yes, abilities? Ability. Yes. Uh, well, I do believe that a large proportion of this subject is, is very paranormal and psychic in nature. Uh, I'm good friends with uh, Paul and Ben Eno and, and his uh, uh, group now that we've had them on the show quite a few times. Uh, they go down to Pennsylvania. There's a, a Pennsylvania Triangle kind of like the, uh, well, I was going to say the Bermuda Triangle, but the Bridgewater Triangle in, uh, in uh, New England. Uh, and they're having all sorts of exper interrelated experiences, not just uh, UFO sightings, but Bigfoot is showing up and uh, uh, there are voices in the air that they're hearing and strange sounds and things like that. These are window areas or, or, or portals or vortexes or whatever you want to call them. In fact, this uh, UFO Deja Vu book, which will be out before Christmas, that's where we spend most of our time is at the Bradshaw Ranch and the Skinwalker Ranch. And we got an interview in there with George Knapp and uh, uh, Tom uh, Dongo down there in uh, Sedona, who's like the uh, uh, knows more about what's going on in Sedona than anywhere else. I would say if you're going to have a paranormal experience, that's the place to go. And I could tell you about uh, uh, a synchronicity. Now, synchronicity is my is my bag outside of UFOs. Uh, I think that uh, we're we're actually being told to shut up again. <laughs> we're so bad. Okay, we'll talk we about synchronicities when we get more back. Hours, <laughs> more hours to go. Right? Yeah. I, I know, I know. I'm Erica Luke's here with Tim Timothy Green Beckley. Oh dear Lord, Tina's got to edit that out. We're so in trouble. <laughs> we'll be right back. Well, at least we're at least we're not drinking. <laughs> Stand by. This is and now. Your host of UFO Classified. Are you ready? Erica Lukes. Erica Lukes. I know. Erica I, I know. It's so scary, isn't it? But I, I, I'm for multiple reasons. But I just have to say, I always, when I come back to this last segment, it makes me a little sad because I could talk I all night. And I have tears loved, in my eyes right now. I know. I oh, tears you're so in my sweet. eyes right now. We're so oh, sweet. Yes. Thank you so much. I, but I, I do. Just like you, I love talking to people and learning from people. And it's always, it's it's a lot of fun for me. And I have to, first well, we of all. We decided we're going to change my uh, my nickname here from uh, Mr. UFO, uh, the Hunter Thompson of ufology, to Sp SpongeBob. Bob Sponge, what's his name? Yeah. <laughs> 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 that's you know it's just not as sexy but you know no, uh, that's I, well i don't know i wear shorts uh <laughs> shorts or something right what, I, what well, is bob wear i don't, I, I don't know it's, yeah. I, I don't know yeah oh, I guess okay you have to well, weigh your options there you know? I, I i suppose it depends on what kind of crowd you're dealing with i suppose yeah good point but, uh, you know yeah yeah you know you the know what 10 I, crowd I, you're gonna be a hit Oh boy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to. You don't want to go there today. I mean, good. Well, probably here. not. Good, good for you. Yeah, but. yeah. Uh, okay. So you, you know what? I hear we've got. We're down to half an hour here. Uh, so I got to pack as much information as possible. But uh, now I think. Uh, okay, I did a book. Let's see. Uh, about a, a little over a year ago. It, it's one of my uh, favorites out of the the three hundred. Uh, it's called. The Matrix Control System of Philip K. Dick and the Paranormal Synchronicities of Timothy Green Beckley. Now, uh, I guess most of your uh, listeners who would know who Philip K. Dick uh, is, uh, because on Amazon now there's uh, uh, the what was it, the, high, the Man in the High Castle and uh, uh, there's a, a Total Recall. It was based on his, uh, you know, his his books. Now, Philip K. Dick was one of the few science uh, fiction uh, writers who had a, an interest uh, in all this kind of weird uh, 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 type of, uh, you know, information. In fact, uh, back in 19, I think 1977, he was in, in France attending a um, science fiction 
uh, convention. And he was up at the, uh, uh, the uh, podium. And uh, I think he was doing a press conference. So there was a lot of science fiction media in the, in the audience and a lot of fans. And he was fairly well established and well known, but not as much as he is uh, uh, today. Uh, the, high, the man in the, the high castle is the program that's on uh, Amazon Prime. Anyway, he, he got up in front of this room of about uh, 400 people. And he made what would be considered to be an astonishing uh, admission. And I would just quote this here. This is from Philip K. Dick, and it's from my book, The Matrix Control System of Philip K. Dick. People claim to remember past lives. I claim to remember a very different present life. I know of no one who has ever made this claim before, but I rather suspect that my experience is not unique perhaps as unique to the fact that I am willing to talk about it. We are living in a computer program reality. And the only clue we have to it is when some verbal cue is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in the same way, seeing the same thing, hearing the same words, I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a verbal cue was changed, pro reprogrammed, as it were, and because of this, an alternative world branched off. Well, he was the first individual, as, as far as I know, who revealed the fact that we are living in a parallel universe. Perhaps simultaneously, we are living in more one, uh, more than one universe at the same time. That there may be a three of you and six of me. Um, put myself in court. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that uh, somebody is controlling all of this. Uh, I mean, and and the proof of this is through synchronicities I, I mean to a large degree and and this uh, this uh, this book here happens to be about the 400 i just lost my microphone uh the the book happens to be about 460 pages uh, part of it is about philip k dick and his uh interest in ufos he had a men in black experience he uh, it took a lot of drugs he he, he led a very interesting uh, life uh, uh, but he did not see his first his first movie. Uh, he passed away just before the movie was uh, released. I don't remember his total recall. Blade Runner. That that's one of the uh, the uh, the movies. Blade Runner. He passed away maybe a month or so before the movie came. You know, he was married uh, five times. Uh, we've had uh, uh, his fifth wife on our program several uh, times. So she's very knowledgeable. Knowledgeable uh, uh, Tessa Tessa Dick. And, and she's written, uh, you know, her experiences with uh, Philip K. Dick. But anyway, I'm, I'm into the synchronicity, and they have plagued me uh, all my uh, life. Now, uh, let's let's just start out with one. Okay, people think of synchronicities. They'll say, oh, I thought of somebody, and they called two days later on the telephone. I don't even count that. Or I woke up, and the clock said 1111 or 444. I'm not even sure what that means, but... I, I didn't even put those in my book. I mean, that's kind of childish and it doesn't prove anything. But to my way of thinking, there's somebody out here who's controlling us to some degree. Now, can we break out of the uh, the, the matrix or would we want to break out of the matrix? And if we broke out of the matrix, what would happen to us uh, all? And maybe we are breaking out of the matrix and they don't like it. And that could be the reason for some of the UFO ex experiences of paranormal things that are happening. But it, there's an opening between their world and our world, and it's through vortexes and stargates and and, and, and portals and, and all of that. Okay, let, let, let's let, let's go let's go back to uh, 1971, 72. Uh, I was invited uh, uh, to speak at a, a UFO uh, conference in San Francisco. I had never been to San Francisco before, and of course, I was looking forward to it. They were paying my uh, expense and a little uh, uh, lecture fee. And uh, I think my uh, 
uh, appearance at the, uh, the in the hotel to give my presentation. It was like on a Saturday night. Uh, so I gave my talk about an hour, and I guess it was about 400 people there. It had a fairly good reception. And the next day, uh, before uh, I, I had a, a, a flight uh, back to Newark at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So I checked out at a hotel, and we had some time to kill. So the uh, promoters of the conference, Dale uh, Reddick and his wife, and he since deceased, uh, decided, well, let's uh, take Tim Beckley to, uh, to brunch. And we'll invite some of the uh, uh, board of directors for the uh, UFO uh, uh, group that he was running at the time. Uh, the, uh, the presentation was under the banner of the Congress of Scientific Ufologists, although we didn't have a, a, a scientist in the, in the group, really. But it was a, it was a good catch-all name, and it got us on a lot of um, – it got us some media attention and, and so forth. Uh, and uh, anyway, so we, we picked a place, or they picked a place at random to have a, a, a brunch. Uh, I've never been into this por- uh, a part of town. Well, I've never been to San Francisco. And the people who picked this place, well, we kind of picked it at random. I think we were just uh, you know walking around and we said, looked at the menu and said, hey, they got Bloody Mary, so let's go in and, and have brunch. Okay, so we walked into this place and we sat down and we start uh, you know, chatting, kind of idle uh, conversation. We didn't have too much to say, but I happened to mention, I said uh, to the promoter and his friends, you know, if I had thought about this and planned a little bit better, maybe I should have called some of the people that I moved to used to live in New York and uh, came out here to San Francisco that I hadn't been in touch with. And, and one fellow in particular came to mind. He was a, a well-known a psychic and a, uh, uh, well, they didn't call him a remote viewer, but astral projection type person uh, by the name of Alan Vaughn. And he had a very stellar uh, reputation, but he was also... Uh, quite a character. He liked to drink beer, uh, liked to uh, to do a little bit of partying. Uh, he, he was uh, he was somebody that I didn't mind socializing with, and he spoke at our New York School of Occult Arts and Sciences and gave lectures and workshops and all. Well, he had moved to San Francisco from uh, uh, the Brooklyn area because he got offered a job, uh, a rather prestigious one at the time, as editor of Psychic Magazine. Now, in those days, there were newsstands. Sure, some people, young people today, don't even know what that is. Newsstands, it's old magazines. And one of the magazines, of course, Fate Magazine was around, and Ray Palmer's Flying Saucers. And somebody with a little bit of backing decided to start a magazine called Psychic, which was aimed at a more academic uh, audience, where Fate had scary ghost stories and UFOs uh, and pieces. This had interviews with Peter Hurtos and Gene Dixon and... Uh, uh, Eileen uh, Garrett, the famous medium, and Bishop Pike, and, and, and so forth. And it was printed on glossy paper with color photographs. So I said to these people, geez, it's too bad that I didn't get a chance to call Alan Vaughn because I would have liked to see him. Two minutes later, the uh, door to the restaurant that we were open, uh, wings open, and somebody comes in walking their dog. And I look at the fellow and I say to myself, that looks like Alan Vaughn. And so I motioned this gentleman over to the table and he sat down and it was Alan Vaughn. I mean, here, we had never been in this restaurant. I had never been in San Francisco. He had never been in this place before. He said he was walking his dog and he felt like uh, uh, getting a a beer. So he decided to stop into this uh, place at random. So we had a good chuckle over that. I mean, that's quite a synchronicity. You're in a town 3,000 miles away that has a million people and you're sitting in a restaurant where you've never been before, and here comes the guy you're talking about through the door five minutes later. Okay, but here, here's, the, <laughs> crazy. Here's, here's, here's the punchline. I said, well, Alan, what are you working on now besides being editor uh, of Psychic Magazine? Well, he says, you know, I'm working on a book on synchronicities and coincidences, and I guess I have to put this in there. So if you can find this 50-cent paperback, I think it was published by Pocket Books or Signet. Uh, it's uh, on synchronicities and coincidence by Alan Vaughn. But there's, a, there's a, a, a page in there about our synchronicity. I mean, okay, that, that, that's pretty bizarre, but hey, okay, it could happen, uh, you know, once or twice. But I got enough to fill a 450-page book. I'm in Tucson, Arizona, and I'm spending some time with my friend, Charlotte, who, uh, like I say, is uh, my photographer when I'm out there. We, we socialize, and, uh, and she listens to all the uh, the shows and critiques my appearance. <coughs> Quite a nice uh, lady. I'm very much and uh, 
uh, we we spent the afternoon with a fellow by the name of Alan Benz, who has a local UFO group there in uh, Tucson, and he's been involved uh, in the UFO uh, work for decades. I originally met him, I think, in Cleveland. He was part of the uh, Rick Hilberg's uh, circle with the Congress of Scientific Ufologists and, and one other uh, UFO UFO Digest magazine, whatever they were doing at the time back in the uh, back in the late sixties, early seventies. And he transplanted himself to Tucson, and he got uh, the uh, the job. Uh, I'm sure it was a non paying job. Is librar- He was a professional librarian. He got the job as librarian for APRO, uh, Jim and Cora Lorenzen's uh, group. And uh, like I say, they had all these these foreign reports that had been translated, many of them to do with humanoid, uh, you know, sightings and features and so forth that nobody else had. And they had quite a, 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 a gr- uh, international uh, group of uh, contributors. Uh, in fact, uh, we do rely on, on some of their uh, material uh, in, our, in our books because they did a lot of good investigative uh, work. So Alan was the librarian, and one day he was approached by Jim and Carl Lorenzen and said, hey, they had been getting phone calls from a, a Hollywood uh, studio, and the Hollywood studio wanted them to uh, advise on a film that was in the early stages of production, but they were too busy or they didn't want to do it or something. So they told Alan, well, you'd be our liaison between the, uh, the production company. Uh, and it turned out that it was the, uh, I don't know, Paramount Studios or whoever, and uh, they were working on gathering material for Steven Spielberg and Close Encounters. This was in the early stages, and they were looking for, you know, ideas and stuff uh, you know, I, I later on became the editor of the Post Encounters Post Magazine uh, book, and my job was was to take real UFO sightings and to correlate them to incidents that were in the movie. So I, I spent maybe three hours interviewing uh, Alan Benz about his invol- uh, involvement with uh, APRO. Okay, so finally at the end of the day, we, we said goodbye and so forth. And Charlotte and I got into her vehicle, and we headed towards Sedona. Now, we didn't tell anybody where we were going because, frankly, it was none of the business. And so we got it. And it's about maybe a three-hour uh, drive uh, uh, down there. And um, uh, we usually uh, stop at a place. And just before you get into a, a town, uh, there's a, co- uh, a place called the Coffee Pot, which is right on the uh, edge of one of the, uh, the vortexes. If you get a map of uh, Sedona, there's like four vortex or portals in, in, in town where there is an increased uh, chance of weird things to take place. So uh, the coffee pot is known not only for coffee, of course, but they have 103 different kinds of omelets. Can you imagine that? I think the last one, 103, is like pineapple, uh, peanut butter, and jelly, which is not to my taste. But, uh, you know, you could go, if you're into brunch, that's the place you get a Bloody Mary and, and an omelet of your, uh, your choice, and your choice would probably not be the same. Okay, so we sat there and we chat for a couple of hours or so. You know, it's a, a nice weather and it's beautiful scenery. You can see the mountains, and, uh, red rocks and cliffs and Bell Rock and all of this other stuff. There that people go to meditate and, and have uh, UFO experiences and so forth. Okay, so we leave the, uh, the, the uh, restaurant and we go out to the parking lot and uh, we go to get into Charlotte's car. And next to us, a parking space there, uh, is a, a, a vehicle, a car, and it's pulled down a little bit more than it should be. Uh, you know, it's kind of like angular uh, 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 parking, you know, where you kind of uh, pull in or out of mm-hmm. the, the parking spot. It's not parallel parking. Okay, it's the other kind of uh, parking. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, there are lines on the, uh, on the ground where you're supposed to be car in, but their car is sticking out a little bit more. Uh, okay, it, it's the back part of the uh, the car. You know, it's facing outside, so we can just pull out back away. And we happen to lo- notice the license plate on the car. What does the license plate say in big bold letters? Uh, you know, right where uh, above it, it says the state of Arizona, and underneath it, in huge letters, A P R O. Now, wow. Apro, Apro, the group has not been in existence for. 30 years, we have just met with the former librarian of the group who did not know where we were going. And even if anybody knew where we were going, 
there's no there's no real member. I, I asked them, well, are any of the children like? Did they have children? Are they interested in the subject? And Allison, no, they 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 couldn't care less. Nobody even knows where the actual files are. They're, right. they're stuck um, in some warehouse mm-hmm. or or something uh, somewhere. Maybe we can uh, try to find them. Uh, uh, someday. I think, Somebody, uh, yeah, they, I think people know where they are. It's just that the two people that own the files, the, yeah, they're just yeah, not going to give it up. So, yeah, and and they have no they have no interest in doing anything with it either. It's not right. like it, it's, it's got any got no commercial value to it. They don't let other researchers uh, get to it. But here, parked in the space next to us, is is, is, is a car that says Apro. Nobody knows wow. that we're there. What I mean, what is the chance? That is so but I got, I, okay. But I, I mean, I, here, okay, I went to Atlantic City uh, recently. I, I don't even gamble, but I go down with my friend Maria D'Andrea, who writes uh, psychic books uh, for it, because it's a cheap room, it's a nice drive, you're on the beach, and uh, uh, there's a million restaurants and an IMAX theater, and it's, it's, something, it's something to do. Okay, so we're, we're on the Greyhound bus, and we're headed, we're headed down there, and just before you get to the, to the hotel, you go through the side streets of uh, Atlantic uh, City, and there's a bed and breakfast there. I don't remember what the name of it is, but up on the roof, and I have no reason why this is there. There are statues, uh, sculptures of the Blues Brothers, Dan Aykroyd and John Bellucci. Don't ask me what they're doing on the roof, but it's a piece of it's a piece of art, right? And of course, now Dan is interested in UFOs, and uh, you know uh, his. Grandparents had a spiritualist group. That that's how yes, Ghostbusters was, yep, was, yep. Yeah, Ghostbusters was was written because he used to sneak in and, and, and watch the seances that his grandparents were uh, right. Were, were having. And I, and I, I have to just say that I do have a question from the audience, and we're getting ready to close okay. the show, so I just I want to make sure we've got time. Okay, go ahead. Okay, and I'm so sorry. To, and this just means you're going to have to come back right. again and again. But I do. I have somebody that wants to know who Commander X is. Tell us about Commander X. Oh, well, I, I I can't tell you who Commander X is because I I I, I was sworn to secrecy, and it it doesn't matter because if I told you his name was Joe Blow, you wouldn't know who Joe Blow is anyway. But there is a book where we re- reveal who the ghost writer is for some of the material of uh, Commander X. Uh, Commander X would send us this material, and it was not in. in it was good information, but it was not in uh, uh, an order that you could actually publish it. Somebody would have to put it, you know, it, it together. So we hired a ghostwriter who was a well-established conspiracy writer. But you're gonna have to buy the book to find out who it is, or you can go to the uh, internet if you go to Amazon.com and look for my blog. It's probably uh, in in one of there. But it, it was a. Uh, it's not the person who's the actual source of the material, but somebody did uh, put and organize the uh, uh, the uh, the work. Uh, and then recently on on the, the travel the, the channel that you're well established uh, on, there's a show about personalities, uh, uh, celebrities who mm-hmm. have had uh, UFO experiences. And there's a fellow by the name of Hal Sparks, who's a comedian yes. who got the job. Yeah, okay, he got a job. Uh, in uh, Hollywood, the first job he got was working for somebody who was writing a science fiction script. And so they told him to go out and buy all the UFO books uh, that he could to find out about, uh, you know, a- aliens and what people were seeing. And he got a book by uh, Commander X, which he actually read a paragraph or two from on the air. And he got, uh, he realized that he'd had a sighting when he was uh, uh, like, a you know, a, a 10 or 11 years old. And he realized that he might be a UFO repeater or a, a genera- generational uh, abductee. And he, when he went home over uh, Thanksgiving vacation to talk to his, uh, I guess his aunt or his mother or somebody, who, and, and how proud he was to get his first job in Hollywood. And he said about what he was doing. He said, oh, you ought to talk to your uncle, uh, you know, because he's had UFO experiences. And it turns out that there are other people in the family who had, had UFO sightings and so forth. And so now he thinks he may be a generational uh, abductee, and it's all because of Commander X. And and so are Branton and Commander X are two different individuals, oh, right? No, no. Oh, oh no, has not, no, Branton has nothing to do with Commander X whatsoever. Okay. Uh, although although Branton is the type of person he'd take a book and, and just throw in a lot of you know he'd quote from here there and the other uh, everywhere else, so you never quite know exactly who he, he gives credit, but it's a 
his paragraphs are like a page and a you know a half long sometimes you never know quite exactly what his source material but no 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 relationship what okay. whatsoever okay and i it's, i have to come back on to finish my uh, my story about yes. the dan Act. or you can buy the book you can get the book matrix control system of philip k dick and the paranormal synchronicities of tim beckley you can get it on amazon or heaven help me you can find me on facebook or through kcor and listen to exploring the bizarre on thursday night there you go it's a I great know how show. To plug. You know, I never, I, I, I always learned early out, you got to plug your own stuff. Yes, you, know? you do. Because some, some hosts would never even mention it. And I, you're not going to get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that, that's important. And you've done, you've written yeah. so many books. And, and well, I didn't and even I, get to I, talk to you about David make, Bowie. You know, yes, we didn't. And, and, I do, and I do make a living from this. And I, I, and I pay people to do work. So I got to have, you know, if it wasn't for making money on this, I would have never been able to carry out my investigation. I mean, we got paid six, seven hundred dollars for articles in the old days. And, and I went out and I spent it on conference calls and traveling around and right. doing all of this, stuff, you know, so there you right. go. Absolutely. Okay. It has been fun to have you on here. Comes here. The here comes I the group. I hear the group. <laughs> I know. Tina's good that way. I'm Erica Luke's here with Tim Beckley. Thank you for joining in tonight. You can stick around for Willie Miranda. And I will get links to all of Tim's stuff. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I will be here next week with Dave Beatty. This should be an exciting conversation. So have a good night and stick around. We will catch you next week. 